Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Steve Ruprecht um, uh, from the University of Johannesburg, and I'll be chairing the session today. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to our third DMI webinar uh, for this month. Uh, today, Kabeshnini, I hope I say that right, Governor Naidu will be presenting mental illness surviving the next wave of the pandemic. Um, we'd also like to thank Impala Platinum for their uh, sponsoring this event or these events for the month. And um, I'd like to just briefly read uh, Kavashini's uh, uh, CV. Um, she's from the University of Cape Town, trained as a clinical psychologist and a specialist organizational development and support consultant. And after about 20 years of clinical uh, experience. Kevashini has co-founded Impolo sorry, Consulting. She has an interest in systems psycho, uh, psychodynamic work and has since developed an expertise through uh, extensive and diverse experience in the public and private sector in South Africa and the UK. She is especially interested in the impact of mental health issues in the workplace, as well as issues of race, power, and gender within organizations. Currently, she consults for the University of Cape Town and has been doing so for the past nine years. So I'll hand over to you to carry on with your uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and thank you for inviting me um, to the session today. Um, quickly going to start my slideshow. There you go. Um, as Stephen says, my name is Kivashni Govinda Naidu, um, and I'm a co-founder and director of Impilo Consulting. Um, we're a specialist organizational development and support um, consult consultancy. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about mental illness surviving the next wave of the pandemic. Um, I just want people to take, um, and Stephen, you're going to have to help me with this a little bit. I'm putting up this picture um, and I'm just wanting to hear from people what this evokes for you. Um, I want you to imagine yourself as being in one of these buildings, standing at the window and looking out onto this wave kind of coming towards you. Um, you could be in your home looking out through this window. Um, you could be at your work looking out through this window. But I'm wanting a little bit of input and in how people, what are some of the feelings that would be invoked? And Stephen, I wonder if you can help me with that. Kavashni, I think you're, you haven't shared your screen as yet. We don't see anything on the screen. Okay, let me just... Yeah, so I think what we also can do in terms of your question, if the, from the participants, if, if you would like to perhaps raise your, your hand or something and uh, uh, make a comment that uh, we then the, we can identify you and uh, open up your mic uh, to allow you to, to answer that uh, question of what you see and how you feel and things like that. Yeah. Can everyone see the slide now, Stephen? Yes, we can. Great. So again, I just want to invite people to, to tell me what the slide evokes um, in terms of feelings, thoughts, and I'll give you a minute. You can type it in the, in the chat. I hear it's scary and intimidating. Will I survive? Terrified, disaster, absolute fear, terror of unimaginable proportions, probably paralyzing, 
it looks as if it will engulf me. Um, movie from 2012, terrifying indeed, the feeling of fear, facing the inevitable and accepting it as such, terror, terrifying, overwhelming, scary, hopeless, beautiful, <laughs> drowning, Just gonna wait to see if there's anything more. Survival mode. So those are quite powerful responses. Um, another response. I uh, thank goodness I com I completely I completed my life saving course and can swim. God help the others. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to reflect back to you. Um, regrets of things not accomplished. I I just want to reflect back to you the powerful responses that people have presented. Um, terror, survival mode, fear, um, feeling frightened, um, regrets. And I want you to keep that in mind. And as I go on to the next slide. So I'm wanting to kind of embed that picture into where we are individually. Um, and that picture, and I'm gonna put it up again before I go on to this one, those feelings that you brought up is what we've been experiencing for the past few months. So what we were thinking of is a few months ago, we heard about um, the infections in Wuhan and how it was coming closer and closer to our shores. And these are the feelings we've been sitting with. We've been watching on the news, we've been listening, we've been waiting, we've been watching, but it's pretty similar to us sitting at one of these windows and looking out through these glass windows and waiting for this big tidal wave to kind of engulf us. That's the kind of psychological impact these past few months have had on us. And I'll tell you more now. So this slide is also really important. I'm, I'm wanting to, to kind of um, build a picture of how we individually are not, are not islands. We're embedded into communities, we've embedded into our organizations and work, and we're embedded into the South African context. And what I'm gonna do today is unpack how the psychological impact of COVID-19 is far, far greater than merely, and, and I say merely, um, yeah, with a lot of kind of con consideration that about contracting the, the virus, that it's far, the, the psychological impact is far greater than that and the threat to our mortality. Um, so I want you to keep this kind of diagram in your head in terms of what we're going to go through and how we're going to unpack the psychological impact. So the next thing we're gonna kind of, first thing we're gonna look at is the psychological impact and individual suffering during COVID-19. And I want you to think back to the picture I started off with, with this big tsunami, this big wave kind of approaching us. Um, and if you can imagine us having to stand in front of that window and wait for that for the past maybe five to seven months before the COVID virus kind of actually hit our shores, that's something we call anticipatory anxiety. Um, anticipatory anxiety is increased anxiety when we're thinking about an event that will happen in the future um, and not a normal event, an anxiety provoking event. And having to deal with this for this amount of time is traumatic. And we call this prolonged exposure to trauma. And any prolonged exposure to trauma can leave our bodies and minds struggling to process this cope, uh, process and cope with these feelings. Um, we're not built, we're not built to be able to stand at a window or stand and anticipate trauma and anxiety of this magnitude. So what our bodies and our minds do is that we can't cope or process this. And so we shut down. So what this traumatic experience also does, it can overwhelm the ordinary human adaptations to life. So the ordinary human adaptations to life is, for 
example, if we're in our car and we reverse into a pole. Um, it's frustrating, it's upsetting, but you know what, give it a day or two, we'll be over it. If we drop our phone and we crack the screen, it's upsetting a day or two later, you know what, we, we, we'll buy a new phone, do we repair it and we get over it. Um, or if there's a promotion we didn't get, over a few weeks, we, we manage this. But something happens when we become traumatized or when we have a traumatic experience. We can't adapt in the way we usually have previously. Um, and we've seen this during the pandemic. We see that people have been struggling to get out of bed. We see the rage that people have. I'm sure that everyone has seen YouTube videos of people um, fighting in supermarkets over toilet roll um, and how there's lots more conflict in your organization. People fighting about who took my milk from the, from the fridge. People are leaving work on uh, earlier than usual. So people can't deal with the everyday stresses like they usually do. Um, and it becomes exaggerated. What it also does is that it further compromises vulnerable people who have existing psychiatric diagnoses um, because of these extra stresses, this extra trauma. And what it does, it destabilizes people who are already um, dealing with mental health illnesses. So what we've seen so far is that there've been significant focus on the physical aspects of COVID-19. Um, hospitals gearing up, um, making more beds available, makeshift hospitals. But there's been, uh, there's been focus on hand sanitizer. We're all preoccupied with hand sanitizers and masks and social distancing. So lots of focus on the physical aspects of COVID-19. But there's been very little with regards to the, the psychological and the emotional impact of COVID-19. And the psychological impact is likely to be with us long after the virus is gone. I'm thinking about how health systems, um, how, how systems is um, one of the organizations I've worked with how they're very, very prepared. They've got um, screenings, they do their temperatures, they've got masks, they've got hand sanitizers, they've got very digital protocols. Um, but there's no conversation about how employees are doing. There's no conversation is, how are people coping? Are you okay? This is new, this is stressful. How are you doing? Um, so the psychological impact is being greatly ignored. Um, and there's only a focus on the physical aspects. Now I want to talk a little bit about the collective trauma that we're experiencing. Um, and I want you, you to have a look at the picture at the bottom of the screen. Um, so in group analysis in, or, or group therapy in psychology, there's a theorist called Fuchs, and he talked about, he came, he, he's one of the founders of group analysis, and he talked about this concept of the matrix, and he talked about people being deeply connected to each other, um, either consciously and, not either, consciously and unconsciously. So people are, can't be individual, we're not, we're never an individual. We're always deeply connected to other people in one way or another. Um, and how currently we're experiencing a collective state of trauma. It's not that individual people are being traumatized, which is true as well, but we're also being traumatized as groups and as collectives. And this kind of trauma can change the entire fabric of a society. It can change it completely. Let's think a little bit about um, the 9-11 the tragedy um, and we see how the U.S. altered transportation and travel policies and this was 19 years ago. Um, 19 years later we can see there's still been societal changes in terms of travel policy, travel policies which are still in place. Um, so collective tra trauma 
can change the fabric of an entire society. And now it means that we're treading new ground. Things will never be the same again. Um, I think that's a reality a lot of us are facing. Um, and that can be scary. I, I run a therapeutic group um, and one of the participants said something very profound one day, which really, I was quite disconnected from it until she said it. And she said, everything is new. It's so different. And she was saying that as I was walking down um, a flight of stairs one day, I noticed that I will never ever be able to run my hand down a railing again in the way that I used to, in the carefree way that I used to, um, to support myself, that now I'm preoccupied. I can't just walk into a mall and kind of just shut down. I'm preoccupied with who am I standing next to? Is this person coughing? Is this person sneezing? Um, so we're treading new ground and we're experiencing this collective state of trauma, which is gonna change the entire fabric of our society. Um, personally, at work, in our organization, in our communities, um, it's inevitable. I mean, in this social, connect, social connectedness and support is usually important to buffer the effects of natural disasters, wars, terrorism, historical oppression and pandemics. Um, and, and these things usually result in collective trauma. But how this is not really possible because of social distancing. So usually, um, if we think of what happens in any cultural context or religious context, what happens when people have a death in the family? The first thing that happens is that we gather as groups, we go to the family's home, we, we huddle, um, we support each other, we talk to each other. And how, or when there's a breakup, um, you, you break up with your partner, your longtime partner, your friends. Your friends say, let's meet up, let's meet up for coffee, let's talk about it. So people do this. In terms of us being human beings, this is a natural social way that we access support. We connect with each other and that buffers us. That buffers us when we experience the everyday kind of uh, traumas like death or, or breakups, the more predictable one, but it also buffers us from the bigger traumas like disasters, oppression and, and pandemics. But right now with social distancing, that's not possible. And that's what makes this virus so sinister is that it stops us from being human. It's stopping us from connecting in the way that feels most natural. Um, and, and it's in, been incredibly problematic with the way we cope. So what we've had to do, we've had to find new ways to cope individually and collectively. The virus has, has stripped all of us of our normal ways of coping. Um, so the lockdown, most people, so one way we've been stripped is that we can't call up our friend or our colleague and say, let's meet, let's meet for coffee, let's meet for tea. We can't pop into our colleague's office, close the door and talk um, because we're working remotely. We can't um, meet up with people. We can't do other things that would usually help us to cope. For example, going for walks, um, standing at the fence and talking to the neighbor in a casual way or calling them over. We can't go to um, places like churches or temples or mosques um, to pray. And often people's religion and faith is hugely supportive in going through difficult uh, circumstances. And that's been taken away from people. And what it's done, it's stripped them from their coping, from their, their ways of coping and their strategies. And it's left them open and vulnerable, um, which has been very difficult for people. So I want us to look a little bit about at this, this cartoon, which says, please be quiet so mama can at least sound professional. Um, I'm sure the working moms here 
can completely relate to this, especially the ones that have been forced to work remotely. Um, that this we can really connect with this. I have two young children, a 10 year old son and a five year old daughter. And I was doing a training last week and they were fighting outside my office door uh, around who gets more popcorn. Um, so this is a reality. This is the kind of stresses we've had to deal working remotely. Everything has been changed. So let's look at the psychological impact of working remotely during the pandemic. So what the pandemic has done, it's forced millions of people into remote workers almost overnight as, as all our organizations seek to continue operations. But what it's done, it's, it's also stripped off of our many, many years of working out how we, we work in a certain function, in a certain way. We have certain strategies in terms of how we work um, in our offices. We have colleagues who we can talk to who offers a layer of support. And almost overnight, that's been taken away and we've been changed into remote workers um, and being forced to work from home. So what's also happened is that work life is now enmeshed with our home life. Um, and usually what happened before is that when we leave work, we can drive away and we can look at our organizations in our rear view mirror and say goodbye to it until the next morning. That's not possible anymore when you wake up at work and you go to bed at work. Um, so that's, that has been problematic. Um, I've heard, in, I do a lot of work with organizations and lots of people have spoken about how they're in bed at night and they're on their phones and messages are coming through and how they're responding to emails and how they can't shut down anymore it feels like they're always working, they're always on call, and how it's been very problematic. Um, another impact is the loss of collegial support. How most of us, being at work provides us with a level of support in terms of our colleagues. Um, if we don't understand something or we'd be wanting input, we can always quickly pop in our head into a colleague's office or, or pull someone aside and say, can you, do you have any information on that? That's not really possible. Um, our contact with people is far more limited. We have to email them, we have to check if they're available. Um, there's lots more hoops we have to jump through to gain contact and access to people. So that's been a huge limitation. And how there's been, um, a breakdown of teams. This is something else I've seen in my work with organizations recently, is that we're getting lots of referrals in terms of conflict. Um, managers are coming to us and saying, you know what, my team, there's huge conflict. There's fighting every week. We're fighting around who does what, who's doing more work, and I don't know what to do. And this, and I always tell an interesting story. Um, around how we can think about this. If we have to think about a family um, and this family has an ill grandmother living with them and this grandmother has, has a terminal illness, has cancer. So the family is stressed. Families, uh, the, the grandmother's living down the passage and she's in a lot of pain um, and she's, she's suffering and nobody talks about it. Dad has a stressful job, mom has a stressful job, the kids uh, don't get to play outside anymore because there's no one to take them outside, the dog wants to go for a walk, and there's lots of fighting within this family. And if we really think of it, the conflict is about the stress of the lives, but nobody's really talking about the pain that's going on right now, is that granny's dying down the passage. And what happens is that sometimes in teams or in families or in organizations, when there's something very traumatic or painful going on and we don't address it and we don't talk about it, people turn on each other, like with a family. 
Um, mom and dad start fighting, dad starts scolding the kids. So a very similar thing happens in teams is that when you don't address the pain or the trauma that's happening in the organization or in the team, it's going to come out. People are going to turn on each other. And that's what we've been seeing in a lot of teams recently is that um, there's lots of planning around protecting ourselves from the virus but not a lot of protection around the psychological impact of the virus. Um, another point is the loss of control usually equals an increased control. So I'll, I'll explain what that means. So recently um, we met with this team, we were called in to, to assess this team and assist this team, intervene with this team, where the manager was micromanaging the staff members and they, they had enough. They had enough. They were, they, he was calling them when they were on their break. Where are you? Um, calling him in the morning, calling them in the evening. And they had enough. And it was causing lots of tension and conflict in the team. And when we, really, when we did a needs assessment and we really got to understand what was going on, we found that this manager was completely overwhelmed and anxious. That there was a complete loss of control. There were new processes in place. He was working remotely, his team was working remotely. There was this new system that they were working with, which he wasn't familiar with. And he felt out of his depth. He felt completely anxious. And he felt a loss of control. He felt a, a sense of control before, when he was at his desk and he knew how everything worked, but a complete loss of control with the pandemic, when he had to work remotely and had to do things differently. And to manage this loss of control and anxiety, he increased his control over his staff members and started to micromanage them more. Um, and we found that once we addressed more of his anxiety and offered him a little bit more support, he could let go of that micromanaging of his staff. Um, and that, that was helpful. Distress usually means reduced productivity. So people, during the pandemic are distressed. If we think about that wave, um, about that tsunami coming to kind of engulf us, um, you, people said they're fearful, they're frightened, they're, they're panicked. Those are big feelings. What happens to those feelings? What happens to those feelings when you can be infected or your loved one could be infected any day? Um, those feelings sit with us. And people, if those feelings aren't addressed, they turn into something else, which is fatigue, um, lack of concentration. When people are working at home, there might be noise, the kids are at home, they, they can't concentrate, um, they have to manage kids' schoolwork, and this means reduced productivity. People are having to manage a lot right now, and it's hard. I'm also wanting to kind of point out that we're doing this presentation over Zoom. And for me as a psychologist, it's completely bizarre um, because I can't see faces. I don't know who's out there. Um, and I'm used to sitting in front of people. I'm used to com connecting with people. I'm used to kind of um, measuring the effect. I'm, us I'm used to kind of looking at how they respond to me. And working in this way is completely bizarre and it's causing a lot and, and people to become exhausted by it. People have said to me in groups, I'm all zoomed out. Um, I can't do this. It's, it's a lot. This, this working with technology, working in this kind of way, I don't see people. It's creating a level of fatigue, um, which is another significant psychological impact of working remotely and during the pandemic. Um, so now we look at another layer. So we, we talked about the individual embedded and the individual suffering, um, the, the individual embedded within a community, the individual embedded within an organization and having to work remotely. And let's get to COVID-19 in the South African context. And we know that most of us know that the pandemic isn't happening in a vacuum, that it's happening with the backdrop 
of inequality, poverty, and trauma. Um, this is the backdrop of our South African context, um, which has to be kept in mind. Um, something really interesting I found was a recent survey by the South African Depression and Anxiety Group, SEDEC, did a survey recently, and they found that half of respondents felt that financial stress was one of the main challenges during the lockdown um, and not actually getting the virus. So there's a huge and direct relationship between socioeconomic well-being and mental health. Um, the lockdown has brought huge stress in terms of financial stability. Um, and if you have to think about this relationship between socioeconomic well-being and mental health, think about being, well, people here will have an idea of being, having, being a breadwinner and having to pay for kids' school fees, having to pay for a bond in a house, having to pay um, for groceries. And imagine not being able to do that, not being able to fulfill that responsibility. It brings up difficult feelings. Think about it for yourself. What, how would that feel for you? Um, and a lot of people have been faced with this reality. When the organizations are closing down or they've been retrenched, the lockdown and bans have also created huge lack of control. Um, and I'll explain what I mean. People now are being told, not so much now because we're on, on level two, things have eased up, but there was a point where we couldn't go for a walk. We had a government deciding when we could go for a walk or not. Um, we were dictated, it was dictated in terms of um, when we, whether we could go to gym or not. Well, gyms were closed, so we couldn't go there. But there was a complete lack of control and autonomy. Um, and people felt this. They felt a, a lack of autonomy and a sense of being controlled and, and not being able to kind of make any big decisions. Um, the lockdown and the, brand, uh, the bans brought financial uncertainty um, and difficulties. We spoke about stripping people of their ways of coping and increased violence um, in terms of people feel frustrated. I spoke about fights in the supermarkets and I'll talk a little bit more about the violence in, in our next slides. So I take all the, so we've talked about how we're embedded in all the layers and I want to kind of put it in this diagram um, in terms of all the stresses that we're experiencing right now and how they're not located either in home or the work but how they're embedded in both right now um, because home and work is enmeshed we can't really separate it and the stresses I think one of the people one of the obvious ones is that an infection, getting the virus, is a huge stressor. It goes to the core of one of our anxieties, which we call an, an, an annihilatory anxiety, where this threatens to destroy us or kill us. So it's a core anxiety that we're dealing with. Then another stressor is loss. Um, there's the obvious kind of loss we, we worry about and, and feel scared about the loss of family members or loved ones or colleagues. But people are also experiencing a loss of a way of life, um, having to not do things in a particular way, not being able to go out, not being able to meet people in the way you did, not being able to hand, run your hand down a railing. And that's hard. People are mourning a loss of a life that they used to have. Um, isolation is another huge stressor that we're seeing in our private practice and which is one of the stressors um, that often kind of lead people onto developing depression. People not having someone to talk to um, and often we find that work can be a, a form of social support. You can go to work, you can talk to your colleagues, but with working remotely People, this has left a lot of people isolated. Um, 
so proximity, we talked a lot, a lot about support. So I'll talk about proximity. So now with remote um, working and schools being closed and open and closed, we're stuck with our families. We're in a household with our, our spouse, our children, and this can be hard. This can be hard. Um, and we often, parents, and I've heard lots of parents, I, I do a lot of work with schools and teachers, and I hear lots of um, parents talk about how stressful it is having to manage work and having to manage their kids' schooling. But we often don't think about their kids, that sometimes kids need a break from their parents as well. That parents became, become frustrated and shout at children and kids have to form, uh, follow this rigid kind of schedule and it can be really stressful. Um, another stressor we've talked about is the job security um, and access to services. So during, so we know that services health services within our countries already stretched. Um, with, and with the pandemic, health services has been stretched even more, um, which has meant that mental health services has been, again, been neglected. Um, and that there's really little focus or resources dedicated to services, to mental health services, which means that lots of people don't have access to mental health services. Um, to a psychologist, to a psychiatric nurse, to a social worker. And so they're sitting with, with stresses which then turn into clinical diagnoses and not having any assistance with it. So the other stresses is domestic violence and the, the ban on alcohol and cigarette. And there's an interesting kind of link between them. Um, one of the stresses is domestic violence. and what we've seen is that it's almost a double-edged sword that when the ban around alcohol was list, uh, lifted, we saw an increase in gender-based violence and domestic violence when people became intoxicated. But that seemed to still be there when, when the ban was back and there was no alcohol being sold. That people without alcohol, who were dependent on alcohol or were abusing alcohol or cigarettes, became quite irritable. If there was a dependency and that was taken away, people become quite irritable, um, anxious and aggressive because it's been taken away. And a lot of people with underlying diagnoses usually use alcohol and cigarettes and other substances to self-medicate. Um, another stressor has been, which we spoke about, which was the lack of movement it's being dictated when we can go out, when we can't go out, when we can exercise, when we can't, um, what we can buy, whether we can buy clothing, or whether we can buy essential, what's considering is considered essential. Um, and that has been a huge stressor for people. So now we've considered the stressors um, and I wanna take us through how this has impacted, how this kind of progresses. And how this progresses is, an is that without prevention or intervention, these stresses can and will lead on to mental illness. So let's unpack what mental illness is. We hear this term often, but, but let's unpack what it really means. Mental illness is a general sense of well-being and in an intact state of mind. Mental illness is a disruption in mental state. Mental wellness, it's a normal range of thoughts, feelings, communication, and behaviors. Mental illness is an interruption in how a person thinks, feels, communicates, and behaves. Mental wellness is a person is able to cope with everyday stresses, and mental illness, they're unable to cope with everyday stresses. So when we think of mental illness, we think about someone's disruption, a disruption in their everyday functioning someone who cannot function every day in their work, in their personal life. Um, and that's what we classify as a mental illness. And so just to kind of bring it all together, what we're saying is that there's huge psychological impact from the pandemic and the COVID virus. And if we don't take preventative and protective measures um, around the stresses and the psychological impact, 
it will progress into a mental illness. Um, and we'll look at some of the common ones we've been seeing. So some of the most common diagnoses and difficulties we've been seeing as resulting from the pandemic thus far has been, and my, my, my private practice as well as lots of colleagues, we've been inundated. We've been fully booked because people are struggling. People are at their most vulnerable now. So we're seeing things like depression, trauma, anxiety, relational difficulties, for example, um, difficulties be between parents and children and difficulties between partners. Um, we're seeing lots of referrals for marital problems and relationship problems. And that goes to back to people being um, confined to closed spaces and yeah. And then we're seeing psychosis, lots more psychosis. Sometimes when people become very, very depressed, they can present um, with psychosis. Or for example, if they're using substance, uh, substances and um, if they take substances, they can become psychotic because of the substance abuse. Um, so these are some of the common things that we have been seeing in our practices. And if they're showing up in our practices, they're showing up in other places as well, like your organizations. So I quickly want to take you through some of the psychosocial survival strategies. So we've talked about the stresses, we've talked about the psychological tech, the impact. How can we protect ourselves? One of the things is to stay healthy, to eat healthy in, in terms of building up immunity around the virus, to, to good practice around staying healthy. I think people have different ideas of what healthy is in terms of whatever diet you follow. Um, and this isn't about preaching a particular kind of diet. This is about going with what you feel is best um, to encourage your physical health. Um, the same thing with staying relaxed. And it's so interesting when I, when I deal with, when I work with patients and some people love to, to kind of go to gym. And then I meet another patient who's like, I can't think of anything worse than going to the gym. My relaxation is kind of putting on Netflix and just kind of vegging for an hour and afterwards I feel better. So to find your way, what helps you relax? And no one way is perfect. No one way is the gold standard. It's to find something that's unique to you. Stay focused on goals and priorities um, that um, some we have to let go of some big goals and priorities unfortunately with the pandemic but focus on the small ones the realistic ones um, so you gain a sense of mastery when you achieve them stay connected um, it was really interesting that um, we do this work for this organization and, and there was also very difficult team dynamics so this team would meet every week um, on MS Teams and when we met with them with, for the first time, it was bizarre. Everyone had their cameras off. And we asked, is this what usually happens? And people said, yes. And we asked people, well, let's try turning on our cameras. And that was really significant. Seeing people um, picking up on kind of expressions and just seeing people can have a huge impact. Um, so stay connected um, by using technology and, and try to feel, feel out what feels most comfortable for you when staying connected. Stay flexible. Um, I spoke about how some of us are, are parents working from home and we have um, children and how to maybe be flexible when planning meetings or times to accommodate other people um, who have to maybe um, drop kids off for their morning lessons or, or something like that. Um, stay understanding. We're all going through this and trying to manage the best we can. Um, and whether you're a manager, um, whether you're part of a team, to try and stay understanding. Um, when colleagues are not doing what they should, to approach them with curiosity rather than blame. Stay boundaried. Um, when for example, I, I talked about looking in the rear view mirror and saying bye to your kind of work for the day. I worked with a lecturer recently uh, from the university and we talked about the importance of switching off your phone at a certain time or closing up your laptop and putting it away. 
and maintaining boundaries where there was work time, but there's only also family time. Stay disconnected from everyday news. Um, I understand that people want to know that, you know, in terms of the stats and what's going on, but for the most part, don't let it consume you. Um, where that's all what all you're thinking about or talking about. Um, and the last point is stay connected to mental health services. Often when I see people, I see people in my practice, um, people usually come to me saying there's something wrong, something doesn't feel right. And I often say, if it doesn't feel right, then it probably, then it, it, it's right, you're right, that it probably is. And I often find that there is something wrong. Um, so trust, trust your intuitive sense. If you don't feel, if you feel that there's something not right, go and access mental health services and have it checked out. Um, so how to access help at work? Know what professional services are available in your organization. Um, know the emergency numbers. Um, and I've, when I do work with organizations, I often say this, it's not if you're gonna have a psychological crisis, it's when. Um, and lots of organizations have been experiencing this recently. Um, colleagues and staff members presenting with psychological crises, whether it's suicidality, whether it's panic attacks. Um, it's not if it's gonna happen, it's when it's gonna happen. Um, develop clear and clean protocols. Um, and know, and this must be known by all members of the department. So an interesting thing that's come up is, how do we know, how do we know when to call um, for an ambulance? How do we know when it's an emergency? Um, and what my organization has been promoting, and we do a training on, it's called a basic mental health first aid training. And what it does, it teaches every staff member how to be a first responder, how to identify basic symptoms of mental health uh, presentations and risks, and then how to respond to it. For example, you're not gonna call an ambulance when someone is tearful. You're gonna call an ambulance when someone says, you know what, when I go home this afternoon, I'm gonna complete suicide. And, that, and, and that's really important for an organization to equip themselves with those kind of skills especially if we're anticipating um, a mental health crisis following the pandemic. I just want to end off and sum up with um, this quote by uh, the, this extract from Julia Samuel, who wrote a book on grief work, stories of life, death and surviving. And it sums up the new wave of mental illness, which we're preparing for lots of organizations. We've been called in to prepare um, for this, this crisis, this mental health crisis and this mental health, mental illness wave. So trauma occurs when you are overwhelmed by an event that you cannot process. While the crisis is happening, you are in it and everything is uncertain and unpredictable. You don't have the emotional freedom to allow yourself to process the trauma. So it is held in the body. The most common reaction is to shut down and just exist somehow. It is, only, it is only when the external world becomes more safe and predictable again that people may feel able to reach out for support. So what this is saying is that when the dust settles from the COVID-19 pandemic, people will then have to face the aftermath of mental illness. Um, and how we need to ready ourselves. We need to prepare ourselves. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we now open uh, the Q&A session. So there's a Q&A tab. Um, if you have questions, if you could write them in the Q&A tab and then we will uh, address them. Uh, if you can do that, that would be great. I think that was a quite a useful presentation, and I think a lot of us are suffering uh, from from the stress and uh, 
also suffering or know of people that have had uh, you know marriages uh, break up or relationships and and I do agree you know I have an older son and he's here stuck with mom all the time and me and uh, you know when you're 22 going to university it's tough uh, <laughs> you know you're almost like you're back being a nine-year-old again so yeah I'm sure uh, lots of people have issues and things um, maybe in the interim uh, of while we're waiting for questions um, maybe you comment on you know the the lack of I, I know you talked about the the alcohol but um, you know specifically uh, you know the the smoking and the benefits and um, the tobacco I guess you'd say because I think that has been one where I think a lot of people have suffered and and you know I always kind of wonder if we get it right or the people that we're relying on to make those medical judgments have got it right so I don't know if you have a comment on that or not that would yeah. sorry, sorry Stephen uh, are you asking about um, the use of cigarettes well the lack of actually probably more the lack there of the uh, you know having the difficulty of of getting it although a lot of people may be getting it on the black market not everybody can afford it and you know, and because of that are now put in more stressful situations, uh, you know, specifically more about the tobacco rather than the alcohol. Mm -hmm. What I found in my practice is that lots of people have, have become more anxious and irritable um, because the cigarettes are a way of, of um, self-soothing and regulating their feelings and their, and their mood. And with the absence of cigarettes, we find that um, people are more irritable. Um, they're more agitated. And when they're more irritable and agitated, that, that then impacts on relationships. Um, relationships with colleagues, relationships with their partners, scolding the kids. Um, so that's, that's what we found um, mostly is, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. No, that would be, yeah, that does. Um, Bromwin has a question, and how do we support loved ones, partners that may not be expressive or open while seeing the signs of distress? Sorry, Stephen, could you repeat that? I didn't get uh, yeah. at the end. Uh, it, it was, how do we support loved ones or, or partners that may not be expressive or open while seeing signs of distress? I, I think that if you're noticing signs of distress in your partner, um, that, that that's really significant. Um, my recommendation always is to earn the side of caution. Um, maybe just say to your partner, I've noticed that you're more irritable recently. I've noticed that you, you look more sad recently or down recently. Um, to invite them to kind of open up, to talk. Is, is there something that I can listen to? Is there something you want to talk to me about? Alternatively, um, can I help you um, find someone you can talk about? It sounds like there's definitely something wrong. Um, so definitely to exp you can explore it gently with your partner that I've noticed this in you. This is not the partner I know. And if you're noticing that, that's clinically significant. Um, I would usually recommend the person to have an assessment. Um, yeah, with a psychologist, with a clinical psychologist who can assess um, what's really going on. Yeah. Mm, good, thank you. Um, a second question from um, Eva asks, I found meditation to be helpful while or, uh, finding balance and remaining calm. I love running. However, since level five lockdown, I don't feel comfortable going out for a run. How, how can I overcome that fear or this fear? How do I overcome this? I would like to ask the lady what the fear about running is. What is it linked to? Um, is, is it around the virus? Is it around safety? Yeah, maybe um, Eva can... Uh, provide a little bit more information and we'll move on to the second question and go back to that question then. Um, another comment 
Komo Sang, if I pronounced it right. Thank you so much for your relatable session. What advice would you give me to uh, give to a leader who has to support employees in dealing with the effects of COVID-19? I'm in an environment where people are still fearful and struggling to come with terms with the pandemic. And part of my role is to keep the employees motivated and to give support. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's so important. Um, and this is not unusual. All organizations that we work with at the moment, uh, people have big fears, big worries. Um, and so I'm, I often find that um, giving feedback to say that, um, and, and I'm wondering, I didn't hear Stephen, the, the first part of the question, are you asking how do we give feedback to the leader? Um, what advice would you give to the leader who has to support employees in dealing with COVID, yeah. the effects of COVID-19? Yeah, I think as simple as creating spaces for people to talk. Often organizations think that it needs to be big and fancy and there needs to be surveys and computer programs. It's as simple as creating a space for people to talk. And sometimes I understand that, you know, line managers don't feel uh, equipped to, to have that conversation. Get in, get in someone that's external. Get in, get in a therapist, get in a clinical psychologist who can facilitate that space. Um, what people re really re need right now is to talk to each other. Um, all of us are going through similar feelings. We all are, are, have, have these same feelings. And we found in group work that this is really, really powerful. That hearing that other people have um, similar feelings um, to us is, is a little bit of a comfort that it's not just me. I'm not having a strange uh, response to this pandemic. It's a human response. So that's something really powerful. So um, advice or a response to leaders, give your employees a space to talk. Um, that's what people really need right now. There's nothing fancy or sophisticated. People just need to talk. Okay. Carol has, um, Carol says, I find that emergency phone numbers that corporates provide are, uh, are outsourced and so impersonal. Um, empathetic communication and vulnerability without stigmatization, sorry, with the organizations would help. So I think, uh, you know, what do you say about mm -hmm. that? You know, the, the outsourcing and the, yeah, the remoteness of it. That you, you're bringing up something so important and I hear this often. Um, I usually have um, people contacting me privately for, for therapies and um, I say to them, but you have an EAP service within your organization. Why have you accessed them? It's free. Um, it's easy accessible. You don't have to come see me. And often they say, well, I, I don't trust that process. Um, it feels like everyone will know my business. There's almost a fear of it being leaked somehow. Um, mm. That if it, that, yeah, it will be leaked somehow. Everyone will know about it and I'll be stigmatized. So people often, I find, feel safer with taking it to a space outside the organization that's not linked to the organization. Um, it feels more private and it feels more held. Yeah, there's a, another com um, uh, comment along the same lines. I, I can't see who actually mentioned it, mentioned it. It was in the, the chat, but talking about the same um, people feeling anxious at work. Um, the person would like to know you know, how many persons were logged? Uh, okay, she asked how many people are logged into this session is about 58, but um, carrying this, how do, you know, how many people would carry this message forward to their colleagues and assisting their subordinates wherever possible to refer them to a specialist? So it's along the line, same work, same as the other question about maybe the line manager, but you as a colleague as well, seeing people in distress or realizing that there's issues and perhaps recommendations of how to do that appropriately um, without the person getting upset with you, I guess. Mm. Any I, advice I, in that regard? 
I, I'm looking at the message and, and in terms of how, how many people will be carrying this message forward to their colleagues. I, I think mental illness can't be ignored. Um, it, it will show up. I, I say this in every organization I come in contact with. It's not if it's going to show up, it's when it's going to show up. Um, a pandemic, we talked about this trauma, about this big tsunami, this tidal wave. This is going to, it's had psychological, huge psychological impact on us. And it is going to show up. It is going to show up in our organizations, in our personal life. And that isn't good or bad. It is what it is. But we need to find ways to prevent and to protect against this. Um, so that when the dust settles and the trauma, and, and we're finally having to deal with what we've left with, the aftermath, um, we need to have things in place for people. Yeah. Okay, um, going back to Eva's question about uh, feeling the fear of outside and remember jogging outside and having the fear, you know, her fear is still around the, the virus. I guess it's, you know, mm -hmm. um, going out and outside your house and uh, you still have that threat. And I guess it's, it could also run for other people, not just in exercise, but, um, you know, the fear of you have to go out and go shopping and every time you do it, it, it may be um, putting yourself at, at risk or your family. So maybe a comment around that. How do you deal with that uncomfortable feeling to the, or, or fear? Again, I really like that question. Um, so I've been doing, and, and I'll use this kind of example to talk about that a little bit. Um, I work with a lot of people with, with OCD and um, around compuls uh, compulsive kind of hand washing. And, and since the pandemic, that kind of has escalated significantly where people who were managing the hand washing um, and it's been reduced um, or gone altogether are now back to washing the hands 50, 100, 200 times a day. And part of the complexity of this is that it's real. There is a real virus out there. And th the reality is that we can become infected when in close proximity to, each, uh, to people. Um, we can become in infected with, by touching surfaces. So I think uh, surfaces, I think what makes us so complex is that there's a reality, there's a real edge, and it's not only an anxiety about getting uh, contracting the virus, that there's a real, uh, there's a reality to it. So we can't t say, people, for example, um, that it's not gonna happen. It, it might, it might, we're all at risk. Um, but I, I think what you're asking is, is my fear, bigger than it needs to be. Um, it's, it's hard to respond with what one kind of um, response. I think my, my, my kind of feedback to you was that if it feels like it's consuming you, if it feels like it's affecting your everyday functioning, um, I would recommend that you chat to someone and, and have it checked out um, to see if if it's kind of a normal within a normal range or if it's excessive and if that's becoming problematic to you so what you're saying fear is good but not in excess <laughs> um another person has asked um sepeso uh, if i've said it right um with some people they tend to rely on alcohol to help ease the stress or depression what can one do to make them aware that that this is a, perhaps a problem Often, often when I, when I see people in my private practice, people who present with depression, often I see people who, uh, who are using alcohol or other substances um, as a way of self-medicating. And often when we go, we kind of go through an assessment and, and we kind of engage people around this, that how they've been struggling for a really long time and how this is a way of self-medicating. And once there is kind of that is um, almost exchanged with medication, antidepressants, medication for anxiety, people find that they can let go of the, the alcohol and the other substances. So what, what you really need is 
for it to be properly assessed and to have the appropriate medication. And often people self-medicate with alcohol um, when, and there's often an underlying depression. Okay, um, an anonymous attendee has put out, a, I'm going to try to um, shorten it a little bit, but basically they're saying that, um, you know, m moving to work from home has been a godsend because work at, uh, working at work with a, a kind of a, a staff member, a senior staff member who's a bully and, and all these things uh, has made, made life not so wonderful, but you know, there's this fear of going back to work. One day I have to go back to this job that I'm not so, um, you know, happy with, yet it's not very easy and it's, it, you know, your confidence is eroded and uh, not so easy to, to look for another job, especially in this environment. Um, you know, I guess maybe some advice in terms of, you know, I think there are some people that have those issues and whether the COVID-19 makes it easier or, or harder because you know especially now with uh, the job market the way it is i'm i'm sure it's harder to find work than you know than it, to make a move and yet uh, you're, you're maybe in a caustic environment sorry i had to shorten a very long um, yeah, yeah. thanks I, I just want to firstly say how hard and that must be um we've worked with lots of teams where there have been leaders or managers who've been um, bullying them. There, there's no other way to describe it, but, but bullying. And how it can be an incredibly destructive and toxic and painful experience. Um, and, and I can hear from the question that it's almost been a relief to, to get some distance from this manager. Um, and there's a fear about going back. What I know about people um, and just thinking about this manager is that um, it's very unlikely that anything's going to change with this person anytime soon. Um, and if you're wanting to stay in this position that how you might have to, to kind of tackle it head on by maybe naming it for what it actually is, which is bullying with your HR department or um, I'm sure if you're having this experience, without a doubt, your colleagues would, have, would be having the same experience. Um, so I don't know if, if that's helpful, but um, managers in these positions, leaders don't change um, after five months. You're likely to go back into the same experience. And um, one, one route would be to leave. Um, and it would be a huge loss to the organization Alternatively, you, you call it out for what it is, which is bullying. And hopefully your, your organization can take it um, as seriously as it, it really is. I think reading in between the lines, the person feels maybe that there's not as much support, you know, where the bully might be sure. ahead of the HR department. I guess the comment would be, or a question, you know, adding to it, you know, is that something that you could go to the... You know, you have corruption hotlines, but uh, is there a hotline that, you know, you can go to someone, you know, outside the HR, you know, that you're not getting, you know, getting the, uh, maybe the attention that you should get and going to an outside uh, mm. person or organization that might be able to help you with that? Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a very complex situation. Um, which needs a lot of thought. Um, I guess uh, the only thing I can offer right now is that, yeah, this manager is unlikely to change. So something needs to change. Um, yeah, yeah, something else needs to change. Okay. Uh, then, then uh, um, if you don't mind, we have one more again. Um, a person uh, saying, since the start of lockdown, I've been receiving a lot of bad news, especially about people dying unexpectedly. It's draining emotionally. Um, when my phone rings now, I no longer think it's just a normal call, but I expect it to be bad news. You know, how do I stay uh, okay with that mentally? How do I emotionally, you know, mentally and emotionally when I do receive bad news? Or how do I, I think further on, how do I handle that fear of the phone ringing and yeah, and manage that as well. 
I think the first thing I hear is that that sounds like trauma. Um, it's kind of the hypervigilance around my phone is ringing. This, this must be bad news. This must be trauma. Um, and the question um, seems to come from someone who may need some support. Um, and it, it's, it's incredibly difficult to kind of um, say one thing that's going to be helpful. But um, in terms of trauma can be very complex and difficult and painful to, to kind of carry and work with. Um, so I guess my, my feedback would be to access support, um, whether through family members, whether through your, an, a kind of religious organization, or professional support um, where you can think a little bit more about that but it just uh, what you're talking about is a symptom of trauma um, the hypervigilance the, the kind of anticipating the bad news is there out there um, um, I guess you say numbers or hotline numbers that um, one can call to get um, I guess you say free help because you know a lot of times I think people are reluctant at this stage to do the finances and that's always easy for people to to always go to um, you know professional help because of the cost and they can't afford it uh, a lot of people you know not even afford to eat um, you know are there organizations out there that one can call or uh, even for help with and get I guess say free help yeah yeah you know or you can yeah. recommend. Yeah. As far as I weigh SADAC, SADAC offers um, support. Unfortunately, don't have, <coughs> sorry, the number on me at the moment or the details with me at the moment. But SADAC is a huge organization. Um, and you could Google them and find out their details and how to make contact. But SADAC does some great work. Um, perhaps before, when we go to put the pre presentation online, maybe we can just put a slide at the last slide as maybe um, uh, people could, if, if you wouldn't mind, if you have that, that, uh, you know, these are the contact numbers or websites of agencies that, you know, that maybe address some of these issues, whether it be you know, alcohol related or abuse or, or, or other, um, maybe that could be helpful. Yeah if it's yeah. not putting you on the spot. Yeah, that would be completely fine. I, I also want to invite people, um, if, if you have a question or if you have, um, you're welcome to, to email, email me. I've given my email address or, or, or my organization and we will try and assist you. We will try and assist you in terms of um, referrals with the best place if you have, a, yeah. Yeah. So I know, I know to the audience, we're a little bit over time, a um, uh, little bit more than a little, but again, it's a very useful conversation. Uh, one last, I have another last, last, last question. And I think it's uh, also very pertinent to a lot of people. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of challenges out there in the everyday life. Um, with the pandemic, it feels like work is almost back to normal in a not normal world. Uh, besides hand sanitizers, masks, the pa pandemic doesn't get discussed and is mainly ignored. It's challenging to work in an environment like this. Any advice? You know, how do we deal with people not taking it seriously? You know, walking around without the mask. And I think we, we do see this, um, not only here, but all over the world. Um, I was speaking to my sister in the United States and she has the same problem. They actually in the United States now have an 800 number that you can call and report businesses that are not complying. So, and then there's a fine associated, but here in South Africa, um, yeah, their advice is how do we deal with it? I guess without raging and attacking people. Yeah. I guess the only thing I can kind of, kind of end up with is that we all wear, wear masks and when I talk about masks I don't mean kind of the cloth masks that we have to wear I'm talking about kind of an emotional mask when we meet our colleagues when we meet friends that we 
and, and not everyone always knows what we're dealing with on the inside. Um, and lots of us are going through lots of painful things at the moment. Um, financial difficulties, family difficulties, loss of loved ones. Um, and I just want to kind of encourage people to be kind of mindful of that, um, that we all have something painful behind our mask, um, our emotion, our face, um, and to be considerate of that um, in everything we do. Okay, I think that answers all the questions. I just wanted to comment that if you look to the um, chat line, uh, Taryn uh, Flinton has put on the South African Depression and Anxiety um, uh, web uh, link, so that would help. And your, uh, your information has also been posted on there. So anybody needing that, so that might save you from having to make that adaption to your presentation now, it's there on the chat. Um, and so, yeah, if you are interested under the chat, you'll see that. Okay, if uh, there's no more questions, I'd like to thank you for a really wonderful um, presentation. I think, as I recall, we had close to 70 attendees um, and lots and lots of questions. And I think a lot of the questions we've, many of us have the same issues. So it was very enlightening really appreciate it and i would remind the audience you know thanks for their attention um your your um information's there if you need any more information uh, go for it it's there and remind people that next tuesday we have another dimi uh webinar going on and my last comment would to once again thanks long uh, i was gonna say long sorry implats for sponsoring this event and thank you for your time, Kavishni, for, you know, spending your time and really great. I've got a lot of emails saying wonderful, thank you, um, or not emails, but, you know, uh, messages. Very impressive. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks. Ah, beautiful. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much to everyone.